Israel's shepherds were not doing well. They were feeding themselves instead of feeding God's people. God is very offended at that and begins to talk to them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we focus today on Ezekiel chapter 24. This is intro 34. This is interesting. As we look at this, we'll discover what God says to the shepherds. Corey is here. Corey, what's up? I'm focusing on Ezekiel chapter 35 and God's condemnation of Edom as a nation. All right, very good. Look forward to that. Janice, what'd you study? Well, I want to talk a little bit more on the shepherds and God as the true shepherd. All right, very good. Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, in Ezekiel 35, there's a prophecy given against Edom, and so I'm going to be giving some historical background on that nation. All right, get your Bible and your Bible guide, and let's begin to study God's Word. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became prey, my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. You know, Jesus Christ came into the world through the Holy Spirit. The Lord overcame the sinful nature of earth so that he could live a perfect life in order to pay the cost for our sin, my sin specifically, and everybody else's sin, and Jesus gave himself in death. We crucified him because evil had created a kind of hate in us. And this hate still emerges today. And many continue to fall into it. There are men and women who call themselves pastors, but have turned their own hearts and teaching away from the Bible, causing their congregations to stray. The Bible is the authoritative Word of God. Let me say that again. The Bible is the authoritative, that means it has authority, the authoritative Word of God. The Lord through His Holy Spirit spoke it through the hearts of men to communicate right and wrong to us. When we fall away from the Bible, we fall away from God. God is not the Bible, but the Bible is what God said. And we should remember that the Holy Spirit is that force who changes things in our lives because we can't do it on our own. I mean, you can't change anything on your own. A lot of people say, well, 
You don't know me, Rod, I'm well disciplined. Well, that's maybe true. You can be the most disciplined person in the world, but you cannot change your heart. You cannot change where you came from. You cannot change how you were raised and you cannot change any violations against you. But if you trust in the Lord, give your life to him, he can change everything that has happened. A lot of people talk about things, you know, when I was a kid that, you know, my father dropped me on my toe and it caused all that. Well, let me tell you something. God heals all that. He heals that. It may take time, but God heals that. And that will be healed. That will be, I can speak from personal experience and I can speak from the experience of many people. God heals you through the Holy Spirit if we give our lives to him. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage today. This is today's or this month's Bible guide. And I would encourage you, beloved, to get a hold of yours if you don't have it. Uh, you can write to us. The address is at the bottom or call us. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click there. And uh, when you do write to us, I would appreciate it if you would think about making a donation in any amount. But I would like you to pray about it and listen to what God speaks to you. Because God will speak and he does speak, let me tell you. He, and when he speaks to you, if you do it, thank you so much. Because God is using you to fulfill his will. And we very much appreciate uh, those donations for lots of reasons. But that keeps us going. Today we're talking about the shepherds. The shepherds? Yeah. Ezekiel 34. He talked about the shepherds too. Father, I pray today that as we look at Ezekiel, we would see what you're doing. We would understand how you're talking and we would get it because today we need you. We need you more than anybody. Lord, I'm not anybody special. I'm just a person. Rod Hembry, that's, I'm just a guy. So Lord, help me to communicate your amazing word to people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at the scripture. This is great. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse one. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, God's word always says something. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. God is speaking to the people who are the leaders, the pastors, the priests, all that. Quote, woe to the shepherds of Israel, woe to you who feed themselves. Hmm. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Here's what we need to see. Israel's shepherds. We're not feeding God's flock. They saw their position as a career, not a calling. God's shepherds are called to feed and teach the word of God to the people. The word of God, that's the important thing. We are not important as people, but the word is. The word, that's God speaking to us. That's what we need to teach, beloved. Now look at the word, it goes on. We're talking 34 verses uh, 33 to 6. It says, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock, the people. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Interesting. The work of a shepherd or pastor or priest is both good and hard. It is not a career, but a calling. You don't come to the board and ask them about the salary. It's not a career, but a calling. We must pray for those who are called called to be God's shepherds. Many people are called. They have not fulfilled their calling. Are you called? Are you? 
prove it. Fulfill your calling. Very interesting. Watch this. This is 37, 7 to 10. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became as prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Here's what he says. Behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand. I am against the shepherds, will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds will feed themselves no more. Or I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. Well, this is intense, beloved. You see, the irresponsible shepherds will be judged by God himself. We must pray for our pastors and churches to grow in the Bible. You know, if your pastor is a great pastor, is he great because of his personality? Wrong. Is he great because he has this program? Wrong. Is he great because he supports missions? Wrong. Greatness comes from the Word of God. The Word of God is that which gives us the motivation to serve God, to love God with all our heart, soul and our strength. Beloved, when we read the word of God and know and understand what it says, we get it. And today, there's only one way to think about this and one way to pray. Lord, I love your word. Lord, help me to read your word. And Lord, help me to truly know and understand your word. Well, it's time to carry on with our Bible study, and in today's reading assignment of Ezekiel 34 to 36, we come across a prophecy given against the nation of Edom and their territory, Mount Seir. But this passage is much more meaningful when you know the origin and history of this nation. It starts all the way back in Genesis with Jacob's twin brother Esau, who was the founder of Edom. And we're going to be picking up from chapter 24, where his father Isaac unintentionally blesses Jacob rather than him. When Esau learns of this, he begs his father for another blessing. Well, Isaac does give him a prophecy, and though on the surface it might seem that it's a blessing very similar to Jacob's, it's actually very different. Let's study. As Isaac is unwittingly blessing his younger son Jacob instead of Esau, he proclaims, May God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. This was a promise of agricultural prosperity. And then came a promise of lordship. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. And finally, cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. This connected the patriarchal blessing with the Abrahamic covenant. And when Esau learns all this has been given to Jacob, he cries bitterly and laments, have you only one blessing my father? Bless me, me also, O oh my father. While there is a blessing given to Esau at this point, and while it does appear somewhat similar in certain Bible translations to the blessing given to Jacob, it is in fact the opposite of what was promised to Jacob. Indeed, though the English reads, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. In the Hebrew text, there is a min partitive, so literally it should read, Behold, your dwelling shall be away from the fatness of the earth. The next phrase of the dew of heaven also has a min partitive, literally meaning away from the dew of heaven. So since Esau's place is away from this and away from that, 
Esau will not inherit the land. Whatever his blessing, it will be away from the land. He will not be the inheritor of this land. Jacob will be. Isaac continues his blessing of Esau and makes three prophecies regarding his nation Edom, the fulfillments of which Jewish scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum has documented. The first prophecy is by your sword you shall live. In other words, he will sustain himself by plunder, and he will live a life of a marauding dwelling nation. One example of the fulfillment of this is in Numbers 20, 14 through 21. The second prophecy is, and you shall serve your brother. Indeed, Edom was defeated by Saul and then subjugated by David. There was also a failed revolt under Solomon. Edom rebelled from Joram, but was subdued again by Amaziah. Yet it shall come to pass, said Jacob, when you shall break loose, that you shall shake his yoke from off your neck. This break happened first under Joram and then under Ahaz. In subsequent history, when the Jews went into Babylonian captivity, the Edomites left their territory at Mount Seir in the Transjordan and moved into the southern part of Judah, where they became known as Idumeans. In addition, later these Idumeans were conquered by one of the descendants of the Maccabees, John Hyrcanos, who conquered them in 129 BC, forcibly converted them to Judaism, and then incorporated Idumea into the Jewish Judean state. Eventually, these converted Idumeans produced the dynastic rule of the House of Herod. So here we see how Esau, or Edom's history, played out exactly as Isaac had predicted. And in Ezekiel 35, we see more of that prophecy. And in chapter 36, we see how the Edomites moved into Israel after the Israelites went into captivity. But of course, God wouldn't have it. God gave the land to Jacob, to Israel, not to Esau and Edom. Now, by the way, did you know that the one-time capital of Edom was Petra? Petra is that place with massive rock carvings in the cliffs, which is incidentally a hot tourist attraction today. Anyway, when you understand the history here, you can clearly see how the brotherly rivalry between Jacob and Esau continued throughout the course of time. And I've actually found that there's a lot of misunderstanding surrounding Esau and Jacob. So tomorrow, we're going to examine their situation a little more closely. For now, it's time to study on. Corey, what did you do? Thanks, Ryan. I'm actually going to be picking up your study of Edom right where you left off. And we're going to be focusing in more on uh, this chapter 35 of Ezekiel, where God says to the nation of Edom, I am, I am against you because you maintained an ancient hatred and you delivered the, the, the Judeans over to the sword uh, during their time of punishment. So as God is bringing punishment, against Judah and Jerusalem, uh, the Edomites look at that, they see their moment, they see their enemy's weakness, and they come in and they take full advantage of them. They essentially kick the Judeans while they're down. And uh, God indicts them because of this choice, because of this action that they made. So today, you and I are going to be focusing in on some archaeological evidence that points to the very fact that Edom did exactly what Ezekiel chapter uh, 35 talks about. Take a look. Arad was a Judean fortified outpost in the desert area of the Negev. It guarded Judah's south and acted as a refueling station for travelers and troops. Arad is mentioned early in the Bible in relation to the Israelite invasion of the Promised Land. It is listed as defeated by Joshua during the conquest. The time period of the judges saw the city of Arad rebuilt, and it's believed that credit should be given to King Solomon for its impressive fortifications. Arad was occupied until its destruction, like many of the fortified cities of Judah, right before the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in the 6th century BC. Today, Arad is famous for its preserved documents called ostraca, letters written in ink on clay potsherds. One series of documents come from what archaeologists have labeled the office of the commander of the fortress. His name was Eliashib, and he lived during the time of kings Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah of Judah, the last kings before the destruction of Jerusalem. This also means that Eliashib was a contemporary of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. 
Some of Eliashib's personal seals were found at Arad, along with many ostraca that shed light on everyday occurrences at the fortress. Many of them are signed ration orders for troops, showing that Arad was a regular pit stop for troops and possible Mediterranean mercenaries. Another is a puzzling note letting Eliashib know that some mission involving the Jerusalem temple was completed. Still another shows off the Bible's accuracy in condemning the nation of Edom. Edom used the Babylonian invasion to conquer territory for itself in Judah. One of these ostraca urgently commands Eliashib to send troops for protection against Edom. It ends ominously get the men to Remet Negev, lest Edom should come. So God's prophecy against Edom has some pretty interesting correlation here with this archaeological artifact of the Arad Ostraca, uh, you know, dealing with the Edomites attacking when the people are in this time period of distress. And that's exactly what this chapter in Ezekiel talks about. This is God's indictment against Edom in chapter 35. God literally says, you know, uh, when you put my people to the sword, when they were in their time of punishment, when I was punishing them, basically, you know, in modern language, you kicked them while they were down. And then, and then it goes, the, the verses in Ezekiel go on and God says, you have maintained an ancient hatred. So essentially, why? Why this animosity? Why have you chosen to go with this ancient hatred? And because of this, because of your decisions, now I am against you and you as a nation, you're not going to be moving forward. And that's what we see as, as Ryan studied, you know, we see the Edomites, you know, scatter and trickle down and survive only as Edomians later on. Yep. So this is a prophecy that can be tracked. Uh, you know, from its, from its very basis, you know, the why, why is God punishing them? That can be tracked archeologically. It, it really did happen. And then the result yep. of, the, of the punishment or the destruction by God, we see that yeah, truly happen. Yeah, the Edomites are very interesting. And a lot of people even today, conspiracy theory people that use that, they call people Edomites if they, preserving the hatred they? hatred they do. And, uh, I did not know that. Yeah, That's it's interesting. very interesting um, how we hear this. And however, what you're saying is true. And the scripture says that God has overcome, that God has turned away from them, but overcome that. So there's yeah. never a conspiracy. God is not no. surprised by conspiracy. No, in in fact, in fact, from where that's that's interesting. I'll look into that more because from where I'm sitting, Ezekiel 35 is pretty fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's but 35, 36, we'll see. We'll see. 37. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I know, I know it's not done. I know, yeah. like, mm -hmm. yeah. there's still time to go, but. Interesting. Anyway. Inter I had never heard that. Thank you for sharing. There you go. Go Something ahead, else for you to study, Something huh? else. <laughs> well, you know what? We're looking at um, Ezekiel chapter 34 today. Rod spoke a lot about the, the shepherds, and, and um, you, you brought into a, mo a modern day look at the shepherds who are shepherding churches now, pastoring churches now, uh, priests over, uh, you know, churches now. But I, I love, you know, God is, is dealing with the shepherds of Israel, talking about his people as a flock. Um, and he's, he's upset because they are, they are taking advantage of the flock. They're not being good shepherds. Um, they are using the flock for their own gain. And this is something that hurts the heart of God. And, and you see here that he places himself as the true shepherd. And there's so many other areas of scripture that we can go to to see him doing that as well. But I thought, you know, if you haven't gone back and looked at Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm, that would be lovely for you to be able to do, to refresh yourself and then go over this passage again as God placing himself as the true shepherd. We see here that he says that he's going to search for his sheep and seek them out. 
He's going to find them and deliver them from where they're scattered. Um, he's going to be bringing them out from the people and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. He's going to feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country. He says he's going to feed them in good pasture. They shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture. This is God the Father. This is the shepherd of his people. This is what God does for us. He says, I'm going to feed my flock and make them lie down. There's other references that we hear in, in Psalm 23. He's going to seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. He's going to bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. This is what we see David as a young man, mm -hmm. as the shepherd. And we see how that David was not a perfect man by far. We know that. But God used that time as a young man to train him in order to take care of his flock. Um, so he, he says here, the verses go on to describe those within the flock who take advantage of the other sheep. God says, I am going to judge between the sheep and the sheep. And I think that's something that we need to we need to mark in our hearts. It will go, it will be God. We do not judge. And I believe it was today's program that you said that as well. We are not the judge. God is the judge, but he will judge between the sheep and the sheep because there are some sheep who take advantage of the sheep. And that's not a good thing. Now, in my last 47 seconds, Matthew 18 verses 10 through 14 is the parable of the lost sheep. And I'll, I'll just read from 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That's the God that we serve. He will come and he will find you when you are lost and you just make yourself available to him and he will be this wonderful shepherd. Read it, Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14, the parable of the lost sheep.